Uh, my address today is, uh, is it's fitting that it's the, the last address in the sense of uh, addressing uh, issues beyond the diocese in particular. Um, but my, my address is titled Extracurricular Activities, the Ecumenical Service of Deaconess Margaret Rogers AM. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little about her media profile and media strategies. As has already been mentioned today, in a motion to the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Australia on the 1st of July 2014, Dr Robert Tong observed that, quote, Margaret's extensive extracurricular activities were largely undertaken in Margaret's own time, during periods of annual leave, or in some instances where her employer decided it would be beneficial for all concerned for Margaret to be involved as part of her employment. And so it is my pleasure today to comment on some of those extracurricular activities. By all accounts, Margaret was an extraordinary gift of God to the Anglican Church. For some years, I myself, though not part of the Anglican Church as such, uh, worked closely with Margaret on the executive of the New South Wales Council of Churches, and if she was uh, at all the synod meetings, she was also definitely at all those other meetings of all the extracurricular activities. I have no idea how she managed it, but she did. And so she was always there at our monthly executive meetings and the other meetings were held as well. Um, I had the pleasure of succeeding Margaret as writer and broadcaster on the council's Sunday editorials on Sydney Radio two, Station 2CH. And I also had the pleasure of writing the entry on Margaret's life and work in the second edition of the Australian Dictionary of Evangelical Biography. In 1994, as we've already heard, uh, Margaret was appointed Chief Executive Officer of, the Ang of Ang Anglican Media and served the Sydney Diocese where she remained until 2003. And in this role, it, I think it's fair to say that she transformed the diocesan newspaper Southern Cross into a free monthly magazine. And I think uh, we have John Sanderson here this, this afternoon. And I think it's true to say that uh, she increased the circulation to about 40,000. I think I got that from you, John. And significantly strengthened the diocese's, the diocese's media profile. Uh, and those who have been around the diocese for a while will, will attest to that, I'm sure. She wrote a regular column for Southern Cross, penning articles ranging from a critique of the theology of Pope Benedict XVI to a commentary on the morality of the fashion industry and much, much more besides. It's probably worth a fourth year project to uh, dig down into that and uh, come up with some, some gems here at Moore College. And then of course, as we've heard, she was from 2004 to 2007 Archbishop Peter Jensen's media officer. Margaret's scholarship, already cited by several of our speakers, re reflects her passion for Anglicanism and her desire for a greater recognition of the contribution of women to the church. Her keen intellect, her forthrightness, and her theological formation were early evident, such as when she negotiated with, with Archbishop Marcus Lone the terms of her institution service as principal of Deaconess House. In a letter to Archbishop Lone on the 8th of December 1975, Margaret writes, for some time I have been uneasy about the service pres presently used at the institution of deaconesses and parish sisters in the diocese. She says, in its present form, I find the service repetitive, rambling, sentimental, <laughs> and possessing no liturgical merit. When I read it, I am unable, she says, to isolate any underlying doctrine of ministry upon which it might rest, and it seems to me to sit very uneasily within the context of the liturgy which surrounds it. So there you have Margaret in the mid-70s. And she goes on, if you are happy with this idea, to loan, uh, she says, I would like to suggest that perhaps Alan Blanche, Peter Jensen, and myself could design an alternate service and submit it to you for your approval. Archbishop Loan was apparently happy with the idea and an alternate service was approved. These qualities and, and others that we've heard about already today served Margaret well in the male-oriented and ideologically charged world of the Sydney Diocese. 
They also served her well in the combative secular media world. The diocese proposed various plans from time to time to make better use of print, radio and television media and more latterly uh, electronic media such as the internet and social media. But probably, maybe arguably, the best such proposal was to employ Margaret Rogers in her various media roles on behalf of the diocese. Um, veteran Sydney journalist John Sanders Sanderman viewed Margaret as, quote, the secret weapon behind Sydney Anglican's high profile in the media during her time uh, in office. Moreover, he says, most Australian Christians will complain about how the mass media deals with their church or Christianity itself. He says it's rare to set, see someone set out to deal with this problem and even rarer to see someone succeed, not just once, but many times. Margaret Rogers, he says, who ran media relations for the Sydney Anglicans for a decade and a half, fitted the third category perfectly. Margaret wrote numerous articles and in later years her media advisory role for, Arch for the Archbishop was the envy of other dioceses and especially, I understand, of the Primate's office. And there are comments in the, in the record to say, from, from General Sinner's point of view, saying, how can that woman in Sydney get all that media coverage? Nobody knows even the name of the Primate. <laughs> well, that was Margaret's uh, secret, secret strategy. So what, do we, what can we know about strategy and tactics? What is sometimes overlooked is the strategic role that Margaret's media commentary played in public life, especially in her role as research officer with General Synod. Where others may have spoken in platitudes or rebuffed journalists, Margaret knew very well how to manage information feeds and provided first-rate copy for media organisations, even though some of her colleagues may have preferred no publicity at all. For example, early in the media uh, experience of Margaret, in 1987, the Canberra Times reported Margaret as calling on Anglican parishioners throughout Australia to admit that they had failed as a church to deal with the problem of domestic violence adequately. And the article closed with another quote by Margaret Obviously, any woman who has been bashed and violated by a man would find it difficult to talk to a clergyman. Hard hitting. Similarly, General Synod's Social Responsibilities Commission published a report in 1989 encouraging bishops to establish a uniform policy and practice regarding divorced Anglicans intending to remarry. Margaret is reported to have called the church's current policy on marriage, as it was then, inconsistent and in many cases producing negative results, demonstrating her capacity for deploying nuance and diplomacy on controversial matters, which I suspect she did every day so she was working. She affirmed that the church would always regard marriage as a lifelong commitment, but added, quoting the report from General Synod, which she had written. The commission contends, however, that translating theological positions into pastoral practices which have the care of people and the development of mature personal relationships as their primary aim will not erode the importance of marriage in this society. Rather, she says, it will demonstrate that the Anglican church is more concerned about pastoral care than an apparent theological legalism. So I suspect once she got to General Synod, Synod, she had a little more freedom to speak her mind um, and, and we see some of that evident there. Media statements also often served tactical purposes. In an article, for example, in the City Morning Herald in 1994, Margaret suggested that the Anglican Church was, quote, on the brink of a controversy potentially more divisive than women's ordination namely lay presidency at the Lord's Supper. And she dropped that into the media uh, pool there. And uh, Tom Frame, a historian and Anglican priest, makes much of this comment. And he argues in a book and else elsewhere as well that Margaret's purpose in commenting in such a way on the policy was presumably to draw out its opponents. And there's an example for it, I'd, I'd suggest, of her tactical use of the media. Perhaps Tom Frame was right. 
So what about a theological rationale for this kind of ministry? Self-promotion, as we've already heard, was not one of Margaret's strong points. She was not a shrinking violet, but neither was she someone who wanted statues of herself placed all over the place. She preferred her achievements to speak for themselves. And this makes it difficult for us to identify a particular theological basis for her media work. Yet there are occasional clues. In 2008, for example, she wrote at length on the role of media in promoting the Christian faith. And quoting evangelical state statesman John Stott, she said, Stott's call for radical discipleship and gospel proclamation is both urgent and necessary. The preaching of the gospel of God's forgiveness and saving grace for repentant sinners through Christ Jesus is the essential message that ought to be the focus and burden of every Christian preacher to the citizens of the secularised, relativist and materialist world of today. She says, since most people rarely enter a gospel-saturated church, they must first be touched or have their consciences stirred and initial interest piqued and gained through media communication avenues. And she commends Archbishop Peter Jensen's strategic use of the media, especially his, his 2005 Boyer lectures uh, in this regard, and adds, Peter does not present as a politician or as a specialist commentator on every issue under the sun, but as a Christian theologian and preacher who is willing to bring his Bible-informed Christian mind into public discussions on the critical issues of the day. I suspect that Margaret had something to do with the ABC's engaging of Peter to give those amazing 2005 lectures, which are still there on the ABC website, in audio and in print. And of course, you can get your copy through Matthias Media. Margaret goes on and she says, to earn its place, Christian witness should be encased with winning persuasion and flair. Christians should not attempt to force their views upon others. They should rather aim to convince their hearers with reasoned and informed debate. Media, she says, in all its forms, provide a tremendous setting to further this aim. Similarly, in her acceptance letter to uh, Peter Jensen's appointment as his media relations officer in October 2003, she would take up the role early in 2004, she said, I believe there will be many more opportunities for gospel proclamation through this media work. That, I think, was her primary purpose and aim. On now to her ecumenical work. Um, and when I talked to the Sydney Diocesan Archivist about this, she said, no one has ever asked a question about Margaret's ecumenical work. And indeed, after I'd spent two days there, she said, no one's ever called for many of the files you've asked for. <laughs> so I suppose that means this is all new. When Margaret Rogers was made an, a member of the Order of Australia, the nation's highest civilian honour, in January 2014, shortly before her death, it was for significant service to the Anglican Church of Australia through governance and representation roles and to ecumenical affairs. What were those ecumenical affairs? And why was a lay Sydney Anglican woman at the centre of them? Well, in one sense, ecumenism came to the Sydney Synod with the establishment of an ecumenical affairs committee in October 1974. Margaret was elected unopposed to this committee four years later, in 1978, and to standing committee the following year, uh, the following month, and faithfully served for many years. Her predecessor at Deaconess House, Deaconess Mary Andrews, was also, at the same time, an active member of the EAC. So they worked together on that committee, possibly on other committees, from time to time. The EAC's brief was massive. Wait for it. It was to serve, advise and inform the diocese in regard to ecumenical matters, to study theological and practical issues arising from such matters, to initiate and encourage discussions within the diocese and with other denominations on relevant matters, to monitor the development of church union schemes in Australia, and to inform the diocese concerning the programs of a wide range of ecumenical conciliar bodies, including, but not li limited to, the World Council of Churches, the Christian Conference of Asia, 
the Australian Council of Churches and its New South Wales State Council, which was called the New South Wales Ecumenical Council, the Evangelical New South Wales Council of Churches, the Evangelical Alliance, and the New South Wales Interchurch Trade and Industry Commission. By 1989, so it started in 1974, she joined in 78, by 1989, the exhausted and depleted committee had effectively ceased to function, and in a memo to the diocesan secretary in March 1989, Bishop Donald Cameron advised that there is limited interest in institutional ecumenism in the Diocese of Sydney. But there was a need to continue to address those issues and those matters, and some of them impacted negatively on the future developments of the church. And so in 1990, the EAC was disbanded and Synod established a new ad hoc work, uh, ecumenical working group whose first major task was to analyse preliminary documents relating to the World Council of Churches Assembly to be held in Canberra in 1991, some of you might remember that, and report to the Synod Standing Committee with a view to informing the diocese generally on the issues at stake. Key EWG players were Bishop P.R. Watson, Reverend R.H. Avery and Deaconess Margaret, Andrew, uh, Margaret Rogers. So that was uh, internal to the, to, the, to the workings of the diocese. There, were much more, there was much more ecumenical work for Margaret outside the diocese, beyond the diocese. And so for many years, for example, Margaret served as an Anglican representative on the executive of the New South Wales Council of Churches and as a director of the New South Wales Council of Churches Broadcasters Proprietary Limited, which managed the council's Sunday broadcasting on Sydney radio station 2CH. 2CH was set up in the 20s and the early 30s to combat 2SM. And so the CH churches, Protestant, uh, versus St Mary's, Catholic. And so we have uh, TC Hammond and friends um, and, and, uh, and Bernard Judd and others hammering out their anti-Catholic uh, polemic. And it was coming back at them from 2SM. Uh, and then John Singleton bought 2CH two, two from the Council of Churches and the Council was able to retain a large amount of Sunday religious programming in the terms of the sale and that's where Margaret and the Council of Churches got involved. So, um, from 2008 to 2010 she also served as the first woman president of the New South Wales Council of Churches. I observed Margaret in, at work in, in executive meetings of the Council of Churches uh, for several years. She was not the sole woman on the council. Uh, other long-term members included Mrs. Leslie Hicks, who would be known to some of you, and Leslie was, uh, worked closely with me, and she was at one time the educational officer for the Council of Churches. Unlike many of, Mary's, uh, unlike many of Margaret's male colleagues, Mary, Margaret spoke only when she had something substantive or new to contribute to discussions, <laughs> and that was quite frequent, and she did not suffer fools gladly, which is something Peter's already mentioned, um, <clears throat> and I can attest to that. The Reverend Dr Ross Clifford and I, uh, in the early days, used to travel from Morling College, where I worked at the time, to council meetings in the city, uh, and on the way back to Morling College, after my first meeting, where Margaret was in attendance, he said to me, words a lot on the lines of, Margaret is good value. Don't be surprised if she appears to ignore you for long periods of time. When she needs your help, she'll let you know. <laughs> and he was right. There was a time, a little bit later on, when she sought me out, and for my part, I always found her helpful, thoughtful, kind and reliable. But before my time on the council, Margaret worked closely with the Reverend Bernard Judd, who died in 1999, and Bernard presented the weekly broadcasts on 2CH. In the early days, they were quite anti-Catholic, but they gradually became more, uh, more sort of rounded and issues-based. Uh, but he pre pre presented those, uh, those Sunday editorials for 27 years. And when he retired from that role in, I think it was about 1996, it's hard to see in the record exactly when that happened, but council appointed Ross Clifford for a short time, and then he was given the evening uh, music program which I call the Elvis program, and uh, Margaret was then installed as the uh, writer and presenter of broadcasts on 2CH, which she continued to provide for 13 years. 
At the time, I was serving as the Public Affairs Director part-time for the Council of Churches, and I mostly was then writing reports, research reports, and lobbying state and federal politicians on, interest, on issues of interest to the Council of Churches, something similar to what Margaret was doing um, in the Synod notes that we've seen today already, and also um, in her work on General Synod, but with more of a, a New South Wales government focus, I suspect. In July 2009, however, Margaret announced to the board of the Council of Churches Broadcasters that she intended to step down immediately from her radio work and that Rod Benson would succeed her. This came as a surprise to me. I didn't <laughs> discover this for, an, for another month. And uh, at the next monthly meeting of the broadcasters company, um, I was asked to come along. And so I sat down and I thought, oh, this is interesting. And uh, it, during the meeting, she proceeded to announce that she was uh, she had arranged for, the, for her departure from TCH and that uh, I was to be her replacement. Now, she hadn't actually talked to me about that. She assumed that I read all the minutes, I think, and knew what was going on. And I was sitting beside her, as it happened, and I turned to her and I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do this, but what's the brief? And she turned to me and she said, I asked that question of Bernard Judd 13 years ago, and he said, Christian social commentary. And that's all she said to me. <laughs> and so the next week I turned up at the station and I continued that work for six and a half years. And then I passed on the baton to, uh, to Russell Powell in January 6, 2016. Let me tell you another story um, from the Council of Churches that illustrates Margaret's great attention to detail and her singular passion for promoting the gospel of Christ. In 2006, along with many other agencies, the Council of Churches in New South Wales contributed a formal statement to an independent publication calling on Australian faith communities to take principled action to combat climate change. And at a subsequent council executive meeting after that document had been published, um, um, uh, interest was... Uh, I lost my place. Um, 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 at a subsequent council meeting, uh, interest was expressed in endorsing the document. They wanted to endorse the publication. And Margaret intervened and insisted that we merely acknowledge it, but not endorse it. And when she was challenged on why we would want to acknowledge but not endorse, this is what she said. If you had all read the statements, if you had read all the statements, you would have observed that the Hindu statement refers to Lord Sri Krishna and there is only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot in good conscience endorse a statement by Lord Vishnu. And so we, I, I assume we acknowledged but didn't endorse the multi-faith statement on which the Sydney Anglicans also contributed. Uh, a little bit about General Synod. On the National Front, Margaret was a member of the Standing Committee of the General Synod uh, from about, I think it was 81 to 2000, and served as research officer from 85 to 93. And that was based at St Andrew's House in Sydney, where she engaged with a wide range of issues in theology, policy and practice. She worked with all the commissions of General Synod, and in particular with the Doctrine Commission, the Missionary and Ecumenical Commission, the Social Responsibilities Commission, on which she spent a lot of time, and also the task force from General Synod on mission, evangelism, ministry and training. Margaret's research work with General Synod, uh, information gathering, analysis, evaluation, synthesis, report writing, networking, representation and publicity, deserves separate attention of its own. Here I will just briefly mention a few highlights of which I am aware. In 1989, there was a large report co-authored with Michael Horsburgh and Ma Margaret Rogers on remarriage in the Anglican Church. In 1990, she wrote a report titled The Future Life and Direction of the Australian Council of Churches, a response from the Anglican Church of Australia, in which she observed that Anglicans strongly supported actions that would facilitate cooperation and understanding between the churches and would initiate common action on prophetic human rights and justice issues. Indeed, she says in the report, it might also be said, sorry, it might almost be said that Anglicans expect the ACC to act as their ecumenical conscience. Yet in the conclusion to that report, she warned 
that such support of ecumenical, uh, of institutional, institutional ecumenism also obviates the need for the Anglican Church itself to initiate and engage in ecumenism apart from membership of the Australian Council of Churches. So you can see the, the nuance there that she was trying to drive at. In 1992, there was a book-length publication, uh, which I saw in the, um, in the, uh, in the display, uh, co-edited co with Maxwell Thomas, chairman of the Doctrine Commission of General Synod, on a theology of the human person. Also in 1992, Margaret authored a report to the Bishops' Conference, which collated responses from the diocesan bishops on ecclesiastical record-keeping practices relating to baptism, admissions to communion, confirmation, trends in adult baptism and confirmation, and related issues. Margaret offered two pages of recommendations for reform. So she was engaged in issues all across the spectrum of social issues and social justice and social concern. In 1994, she co-authored a report on Anglican clergy marriage breakdown, drawing on findings of a survey that she had designed and sent out and then collated the results of, uh, based on a similar survey conducted by Roger Hennessy in the United Kingdom a couple of years earlier. And finally, in relation to General Synod, in her role as research officer, Margaret was also a delegate to general meetings of the Australian Council of Churches when the ACC, the other ACC, was restructured to create the National Council of Churches in Australia, she was appointed as a member of the NCCA executive from 1994 to 1997. Then uh, it's already been mentioned about the Anglican Consultative Council of the, the World Anglican Communion. There was also participation by M Margaret in meetings of the Anglican Consultative Council. And here she went all over the world traveling uh, on behalf of Anglicans and learned a great deal about different cultures and different ways of being Anglican. She attended uh, Anglican Consultative Council meetings in Wales, Panama, Dundee, and Hong Kong, and attended the Lambeth Conference uh, in 1998, which I'm sure would have been nice to be a fly on the wall at that event. Reports of all those meetings were circulated to the various uh, circles in which, she, in, in which she moved. In 1996, Archbishop Harry Goodhue wrote to Mr. Warwick Olson, Chairman of the Anglican Media Council, supporting the notion that the, the diocese had a role to play beyond its own borders. Goodhue argued that it is all too easy for the antipodes to be forgotten in the world church, particularly in the Anglican communion. He said, Margaret Rogers' presence, along with that of Robert Tong, as a delegate will, in my judgment, help us as Sydney Anglicans to be seen and known on the world stage. Margaret also participated as an Anglican delegate to the Christian Conference of Asia, a kind of a regional body like the WCC. And uh, she was elected to the CCA General Committee in June 1990, and then served from 1995 to 2000 as the Christian Conference of Asia president. As well as analyzing and circulating various CCA reports, Margaret wrote detailed accounts of CCA proceedings and also her personal experiences of, and observations for the benefit of General Synod and the Australian Council of Churches. Those reports were multi-page reports and filled with all kinds of personal recollections and, and observations of what life was like for the people that she was visiting. Finally, in 1980, Margaret was an Anglican observer to the WCC Commission on World Mission and Evangelism Conference in Melbourne, and then she was also involved in subsequent World Council of Churches meetings notably the 1991 Seventh Assembly in Canberra, where she was an original signatory to a critical letter to churches and Christians worldwide from participants who share evangelical perspectives. Uh, Rain Padilla was, I think, the instigator of that letter. She's one of about 30 signatories. Well, what can we say about Margaret Rogers' approach to ecumenical engagement? Her commitment and perseverance, I think, are evident. As I said earlier, she rarely spoke about herself and she rarely wrote about herself. But there is one place that I would like to draw attention to where she outlines a considered rationale for engagement in ecumenical affairs, and it's uh, Vintage Margaret. At a conference in Canterbury, UK, in 1993, 
Margaret was invited to formally respond to a paper by Bishop Michael Nazir Ali on scripture in ecumenical dialogue. Her response was published in a book along with his and in the book she makes two remarkable disclosures, kind of by way of saying other things. But they're very helpful for us today. Firstly, Margaret describes a local ecumenical gathering between parishioners of the Newtown Anglican Church and the local Catholic parish for a discussion on the archic text, Salvation and the Church. Ecumenism at the parish level. Mm -hmm. And she sees this as primary, at least at this point. And she writes, a good deal of work had been done by a group appointed by the two archbishops, Catholic and Anglican, to prepare studies on this archic text. When our people from St Stephen's met with the people from St Joseph's, the discussions were about everything else but the text. <laughs> people told their own stories of the, fa of the coming to faith. They were so excited to be together, for they saw the value in their meeting, and they said they did not want to talk about salvation and the church. It belonged to the theologians, not to them. She goes on. If we are addressing the issue of ecumenical dialogue, we need to take this into account. I fear our multilateral and bilateral conversations would appear to be only of peripheral interest to most people in the pews. And the second, it's a longer quote, but I think it's worth saying, um, worth, worth reading, and I'll, I'll close with this. The second thing from that uh, response paper uh, is this. She says, when I engage in ecumenical discussion, like everyone else, I take my own presuppositions and assumptions with me. I have been formed in an evangelical Anglican context which gives priority to the scriptures as the sole rule and standard of faith and life, and which regards the scripture specialist as the most essential contributor to theological discussion. Our theological and social ethical work always commences with a careful review of the relevant scripture teaching and we move from the scriptural perspective we thereby deduce into the issue which is our focus. We move from scripture to context and hopefully we bring a scripturally informed mind and conscience to the issue. She says, there is a danger to this, of course. It is that one can spend so much time on an investigation into the real meaning of the text in the context of the time in which it was written that the whole endeavour is focused on that question and the process can descend into irrelevancy in regard to our own contemporary questions. I am always grateful, she says, for the rich diversity of people and life situations in which I meet in ecumenical circles and I, believe, and I benefit greatly from the insights I am given into the reality of life of many people in our world. I hear the cry for justice and my heart echoes it, but I still wish to move from scripture to context. I do not regard this approach as an example of the imperialism of Western scriptural method, but rather as a model of scriptural inquiry appropriate to every culture which allows one to bring the word, word of the gospel to bear upon culture and context. A priority of scripture and gospel over culture and context, including my own. There's Margaret, the teacher, again. Sydney Anglican Archbishop Glenn Davies summed up Roger's contribution to church life, describing her as, for many years, the leading laywoman of the Diocese of Sydney and a warrior for Christ, not ashamed of the gospel and not afraid to confront those with whom she disagreed, but always with a winsome smile and a heartfelt desire to see Christ honoured in all areas of her life. As John Sandiman put it, her power and her influence puzzled everyone except for those who worked with her and knew that talent had risen to the top. Thank you.